Welcome back to the second part of our Albany adventure. In the first half, we explored this area's remarkable natural beauty. This week, we're diving into Albany's culture, stepping back in time at the National Anzac Centre. Stick around till the end for my favourite part of the video. It's guaranteed to have you in stitches. Running on beach tracks and through dense scrub and then eventually you come out on this four-wheel drive track and back onto another beach. This is definitely going to look like a crazy run in Strava but the scenery is top-notch so struggling through soft sand is probably worth it. Love it! Yeah. Coffee. Coffee. It's, it's a bit, bit bloody early, old boy. Time, yeah. oh, I'm fast asleep. Gosh, that's oh, all right. You must have got up with the frogs or something. It's six, the sun was rising behind you. Oh, you don't have your a back window, do you? No. It's only twenty past six. What planet do you live on? <laughs> too early for coffee, then. I'll come back later. Oh, too early. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was hoping for a coffee, but it looks like Dad has taken this retirement thing very seriously, and he's having bit of a sleep in. Well, he's going back to bed because apparently he's having a good dream or something. So I've agreed to make him coffee. So I took his coffee cup, make coffee over here and then take it to him. I was hoping because he's got that lovely little bar set up, door opens that um, it'd be his place for coffee in the morning, but apparently, apparently not. So I'll make him one. I think he'll get used to being on the road and getting up early pretty soon. Although we wake up because we've got that sort of, you call it skylight, just window right above our bed. So as the sun rises, you get that lovely light and it just wakes you up in the morning. Whereas he's a little bit more enclosed in this blacked out van. So that's probably why he uh, was very asleep when I knocked on his door asking if he wanted a coffee. There you go. Ah, welcome to my place. That's better, you got pants on now. Um, yeah. Yes, I'm watching television, old boy. Isn't that go. wonderful? Much more awake. Loving the life. How are you enjoying your first um, night in your van, on the road? Well, I had a really good night's sleep. I think the gin and tonic, um, the tradition of gin, uh, gin and tonic sundowners last night was really well. It <laughs> made me sleep so peacefully. Um, Com comatosed. <laughs> yeah, first good night's sleep in a long time, actually. Yes, and camping here amongst the peppy trees with the, um, the softening sound of the breaking ocean mm. behind me. It's really nice. Good morning. First day back in the van and realised oh, we're already back to waking up before our alarm goes off. So my alarm was set for 6.30 and I woke up about 6, 6.05, which... Oh, it's actually just, it's really nice. It's what I've missed about being on the road. We found when you're on the road, you tend to get up a bit earlier, go to bed a bit earlier. You get a bit kickstart on your day. And we were lying in bed this morning, and like the sun was coming through these windows. It was just, yeah, golden hour in the morning. It's a good time to be up. So we're on our way back into Albany, 
this morning. The good thing is from our campsite, it's probably only, what, a 15, 20 minute drive? Yeah, it's not bad at all. About that. Today we thought we'd do a couple more of the historic pieces. So they've got a, a jail here or goal, as you've been to before, and the thing that we're going to do right now, which is the Anzac Centre, which I always think Anzac Memorial, but this is the proper Anzac National, National Anzac Centre. And the reason they put it in Albany, because you're probably wondering, like I did, why you put the Anzac Centre in Albany and not in a capital city or, or somewhere like that, is because the entire fleet from Australia and New Zealand, well, most of it anyway, set off from Albany Harbour. So this is kind of where the Anzac legend, ethos, all of that started. So yeah, gonna go check out that. It should be an experience. Beautiful Albany on the way in. Albany is not only a city, but it's one of the oldest cities in Australia. And it's gotta be up there with one of my favorite places to explore. It has a really good feel about the place. The streets are wide and lined with trees. The architecture is beautiful, and as you walk around town, you can catch glimpses of the ocean. If only it wasn't so cold here in winter. So we've just pulled up in the car park of the National Anzac Centre, and I've heard from a couple of people around the caravan site, mm -hmm. and from Dad actually, saying that it's a real, I guess, poignant, uh, quite emotional experience, especially yeah, yeah, when you, yeah. yeah, he said that you come out of the actual centre where you put some headphones on and follow uh, Anzac soldiers' life through the war. Um, very, very emotional. Mm -hmm. So we look forward to that. Birds. Cockatoos. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. All of these signs all the way up this walk, and there must be 20 or so, have three ships on them. And on each one of those, it has the officers, the other ranks, and the horses. And it's just the numbers are staggering. Like on a lot of these ships, I'm seeing like 500 horses. And you think that when they got to France, Gallipoli and so on, they, they kind of just left the, the horses on the ships because they didn't need them. And then they got shipped off to Africa or Egypt or wherever, but just these sheer numbers of people and horses they were shipping was nuts. This really gives you a sense of perspective. So we're on top of Mount Clarence and looking out from here at the two islands in front of us, you can see first, second and third division as they would have been laid out in the harbour. And it pretty much fills that entire harbour in front of us. That would, it would just be nuts. I've just counted 39 ships in total. And you can really tell by the names of the ships which ones are Australian, New Zealand and English. So you've got like the Star of England and Shropshire, super English. And then you've got obviously a lot of place names like Geelong, Port Lincoln, which will be from here. The whole thing is moving. Is that a lot of manual labour? It's surprisingly easy to see how much steel there is in these things. And how old it is, they must oil it a lot. What do you reckon that was used for? Storing something. Good. You reckon? Well, it's got ventilation at the back, so at first I thought maybe it was some sort of oven, but it's really not, not with a wooden door. You think there'd be an oven in a trench? <laughs> Guess 
also a lunch. So you're going a storage cupboard or an oven? Well, it's not an oven. I'm not even going to comment on how feminine those two <laughs> answers were. Well, it's going to be storing weapons or something. Storing weapons or something. Do you know what I think it is? Enlighten me. <laughs> well, if you notice here at the back, you've also got one here. Those holes and those holes in there. And then if you notice all these cupboards, all these doors and lifts around here. So underneath us would have been the magazine. So all the shells and everything would be stored and they would come up uh, almost on like a dumb waiter or a platform. Okay. They'd pull them up and this is where they would talk. So these, that's where they would shout down what they needed to reload or wow. ammunitionize, what shells they needed. So, the dumb waiter would be somewhere, but what would you think was in here then? Well, it's another one of these. So they could talk through. See, it's like ventilation down. God knows, they could have stored whatever, but it's interesting that- They could have, did you see the word store? Maybe they would have stored something. The shells on here, down the bottom, and then they'd raise them up here, and then they'd take them through to the gun batteries. And then there's a couple of other ones along here which just have ladders. So that's where the people would go down and up. This is how you lift up the shells, which I think they've got some kind of replicas of around there. Well, I assume they're replicas. But that's how you lift them up and people would take them to the guns and then they'd fire them. But of course, this was all theoretical because there was never any conflict here. So I'm sure they did lots of practice and lots of tests of the guns, but in actual application, there was no, I don't know, land to ship firings of the uh, the weapons, at least for in the process of war. Maybe there were some, some pot shots at old ships to sink them and create wrecks in the harbor, I don't know, but never used in a conflict. Lots of work. Lots of money. Lots of money. These diagrams show it pretty well. So we're up here, and then you've got the whole, well, we're all kind of subterranean, but you've got the proper underground bit. It gives you all of that extra space between, well, extra insulation from soil, sand, and concrete to protect the shells underneath. Because you didn't want them getting bombed and blowing up, because then you'd lose all your ammo. It's really cool to see these little, you know, the architectural, draft plans of, I guess, what they would have used when they were building it. Section AA, section DD, which are cut through. AA is a cut through of there. DD is a cut through of there. So one is a kind of trench. The other one is this room we're in now. And then the underground, which is, I guess, just there and down from where we're standing. I'm loving this. What kind of museum? takes you through a winding path of heaps of Australian foliage and peppermint gums to get through to the next part. It's a very cool area. How did you find your time as a gun operator? <laughs> Tough. You'd have to have a lot of teamwork with the other guy, hey? Make sure that you're both coordinating at the same time. <sighs> yeah, well one does the spin and one does the yeah. up and down, so you need to be very in sync. Yeah. It's like holding one end of a joystick each <laughs> on the controller. Men are a fine set, 
so duly patriotic. I'm grateful to soldier and citizen for the help given me in organizing and preparing the force, which is now about to do its part for the good of the Empire. In saying goodbye, I would like to express the hope that, no matter how great the demands upon patience, the Australian people will see to it that there is no diminution of their determination to face their responsibility. This spirit cannot fail, then, to pervade the troops. You put me in mind of being on top of a well-built haystack and swaying it about. That's how the ground behaved. Men were driven stark, staring mad, and more than one of them rushed out of the trench, over towards the Germans. Any amount of them could be seen crying and sobbing like children. The nerves completely gone. How on earth we stood it, God alone knows. We were nearly all in a state of silliness and half days, but still the Australians refused to give ground. No one being buried by the dozen. All frantically dug out again. Some dead, and some alive. One big shell killed and buried no less than 15 men. They were after it, pulled out in pieces, torn to ribbons. And another 15 inch accounted for no less than 40 men. I'm certain they tried to break the Australians' hearts completely. They say it was one of the fiercest bombardments that's ever taken place on the Western Front. That was deep. Mm, it was, wasn't it? Humbling. Really, uh makes you think I think going out from a beautiful sunny day into a dark room with all the stories and images and videos and then the the kind of I guess reenactments the voice recordings yeah just transports it's like when you leave a movie theater and you feel like really like you know it's been a really like serious film what's going on you like walk out into a normal day and you're like you just don't know how to feel you're like oh it's sunny, you don't like, you can't really enjoy mm-hmm. the sun and so on. It's just like weird because your whole mind's been in a completely different place. Yeah. So I think it really does transport you back to. Particularly with the original videography and photography that was taken there. Yeah, the, the original videos. Although I loved, <laughs> I kind of found them a little bit funny because it must have been at a time when moving pictures were new because everyone in that was kind of like freeze frame when you know, you're, yeah. like, you're like, I'm taking a video and they're all like, all the soldiers. <laughs> yeah, just completely <laughs> stopped, ready, waiting for the photo to be taken. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that being able to see it moving mm-hmm. and so on, especially for what we do. Yeah. Like videography, seeing it really makes you feel like, you yeah. know, you can imagine what, what it was like to be there. Yeah. But well, yeah. well worth going to. Yeah, thoroughly recommend. I mean, yeah. even just walking around the free part. So all of the first bits of the activities we did pretty free and the last bit going in and and following the journey which i recommend doing is a paid activity and i think we got half price because a couple of things weren't working so it was about 22 dollars for the both of us yeah i think it's normally 22 25 dollars per person so we basically got one on free which helps or half price yeah half price (laughs) like (laughs) i said um so yeah good afternoon still sunny that's not gonna make the most of the sun you can't come to Albany and not stop by the Squid Shack. Maybe that's true, maybe I just wanted fish and chips. Either way, we headed over to Emu Point to see what all the fuss was about. You tell him. You can shut up now. Keep your grubby eyes and beak off our chips. You can hear them. Literally, they were over there when we got here. Slowly, they start invading. Don't signal to all your friends that we got food. You might get a chip at the end. recommend 
And if you're in Albany, you come to Emu Point, even if you're not, Squid Jack is a must, plus you're surrounded by all this water and the boats. Great spot to come. That's why I was struggling with the door. Look at you. I got sparkling red. Oh, that's our favourite. Well, wow. we haven't had that in so long. And then I was just going to go get Great Northerns because that's my typical. Just figured we're in Albany. I'd get Albany proud local beer. Yeah. Albany proud. I haven't um, tried this one. Blonde Ale. I've never tried a Blonde Ale. Well, maybe I haven't. I just have no idea what it is, but I thought it should be interesting. So, when in Rome, get something interesting. Yes. Worst thing that happen is you don't like it, but I don't think that's going to happen. So. of the day pretty good nice way to finish off a day a couple of fresh local brewskis on the beach you won't hear me complaining it's nice to be warm as well I feel like yeah. nice well. shorts downstairs party downstairs rugged up winter and down I'd be upstairs <laughs> that don't really make sense but as long as it makes you know, sense to you you know where I'm going you can see there's two beers missing from here so oh this will be nice Nice Some nice white wash. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, look, we're both in our jackets. That's the only thing about this part of the coast is it's nice and warm all day, but as soon as the sun drops, woof, it's nice. It's nice. It's like you get your your kind of wintry, snuggled up evenings and in the day it's nice and warm so you can explore and line the sun it's a perfect tent it's a win-win summer in albany area or lower denmark or lower wa yeah cozy corner east cozy corner east <laughs> how many different names do we give that but oh. it's, it's perfect as long as it's not raining perfect or windy perfect yeah. <laughs> I've been filming you already for a while. <laughs> Happy Friday. Every day of Friday. That's good. What do they say? Sweet malt aroma with a light, crisp finish. I reckon. That's exactly how I describe it too. Okay. <laughs> What's it called? Big ahead, blonde, blonde ale. ale. It's really good. It's right though. You get like you get a good amount of beer at the beginning, and then a nice crisp finish. Do you not but get a good amount of beer the whole way through? No. 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 So the top bit's beer, and the rest is what? Water. It's like yeah, it's just refreshing. Good because a lot of beers like afterwards you get that bitter taste, like that kind of. That beer taste. Yeah, that beer taste. That's why I don't drink a lot of beer. So you like this beer because it tastes like beer at the start and then it tastes like water for the rest. Perfect. What a uh, what a shining indictment of a beer. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Beer at the start, water at the end. That's exactly what I think they were going for at um, Wilson Brewery. The watery beer to finish you off. Hopefully it sobers you up in the morning as well. That'd be nice. <laughs> you want one? Your descriptions will never get old, so. Have I sold it to you? Do you believe that you work in marketing? <laughs> Please never work in copywriting. <laughs> Don't ever work for a beer brand, right? Yeah. <laughs> Alright, let's hear Duncan's review. Let's see if I can redeem myself in Wilson's eyes because I feel like if we ever wanted to be sponsored by anyone, that review you did isn't going to get anyone, especially any beer company to sponsor us. But I'll do my best. Hopefully, the sponsorships just roll in after this. It's a 
Is my pinky go up then? I have a habit of raising my pinky when I yeah. drink. That's the English in you coming up. In English is one way of putting it. I'll take English. Um, I mean, I was born in Australia and I'm Australian, but there's some English and Scandinavian heritage there. Anyway, back to the, the beer review. Oh, stop distracting me. Very hard to describe though, so I can mm. see where you went through that. Yeah, it's um. It's got heaps of flavour, but it's not heavy. Yeah, well, it's, it's nice. not like your, you know, your chemical beers. It's a really nice beer, light drinking, blonde ale, I guess. But it, it tastes very sort of like um, what I expect, you know, like grain and hops and all those sort of things to taste like. Like, you know, like, have you ever been in a grain silo in England? Or yeah, anywhere? Just that, that sort of grain dust kind of mm. flavory smell that you get. This reminds me of that. And that is going to be the weirdest, most specific review I think anyone's ever done on a beer. So. I've also checked myself out of getting sponsored by any beer companies, but right. Wilson. So out of five, and would you drink it again? Good question, it's a good question. Um, out of five, seeing it's the first blonde ale I've ever had, it would score probably a four out of five, four and a half out of five for a blonde ale, because I want to leave myself half a mark just in case I get better. And would I drink it again? 100%. I think Wilson Brewery is a good one. I'm impressed. Although it's going to be one of those beers that you get in Albany and I don't know if they're in Denver beers all the way around Australia or just WA but I don't want to get too attached to it. The good thing on this trip is traveling around I feel like I kind of get a new beer in every state and you know maybe a couple of times in different states where they're pretty big because when you work your way down you kind of drink one thing in one area and another so I've gotten off my Finns and before that Great Northerns I'm on to my Wilsons. Love it. We're, we're better than a drinker than a beach as well. In Albany. Beach in Albany. Okay. Perfect place to drink a Wilsons. Now I'm sounding like a beer ad. <laughs> Wilson Ale, made in Albany. For a hard earned thirst, walking the Albany beaches, you want Wilson Ale. <laughs> <laughs> that was so bad, eh? That was so I love bad. It. It's basically a wrap on Albany. Last night in Albany. Done. Well, a cozy corner anyway. And then we're heading how far? Five hours to Esperance. So five hours drive tomorrow. Yeah, five and a bit with a caravan. Might stop up along the way, we'll see. But more of the same, but better. So Esperance. More I'm of the same, but better, but okay. I, so more white beaches, yep. more hopefully empty white beaches, because that's pretty much what we've had here. But Esmond is known for having whiter sand in Australia. Apparently. Whiter than um, Ailey. Whitehaven. Whitehaven. Apparently. Okay. Which I didn't okay. know. That's interesting. But Esperance, a lot of beach hopping, lots of beach, beach forward driving. There's a couple of free camps where we can actually get a caravan on the beach. Let's hope that we can actually snag those spots though. Yeah, and let's hope we don't get bogged. Because A, you can't book them, right? No. So we can't book the spots, but we're heading for some awesome beach camps where you put the back caravan literally on the sand and you're probably kind of where we're sitting, but a little further back. Yeah. We should be sweet, especially if I can go spearfishing, catch some fish, we can do a cook up on the beach. So look forward to that. Um, we just hope that at the time of seeing this video, we've filmed that and we've gotten a <laughs> beach camp. Because anywhere down this coastline, yeah. we're realizing that you can't really book um, it's all free camping and so on, so you kind of just got to risk it for the biscuit and hope that you can get a spot. So I'm hoping at the end of this video, there's a nice little highlight or coming next video. And on that, we've got some sick shots of us being on the beach. So yeah, stay tuned for that. Fingers crossed. How's the TV show, so? Oh, beautiful.